In England's southwest, the historic seafaring city of Plymouth overlooks the Sound, which has for centuries hosted the coming and goings of some of the world's greats, including Cook and Darwin. This weekend, the pace heats up. Synonymous with top international sailing events for many years, today Plymouth welcomes the world's fastest one-designed sailboats and the best inshore sailors as Sail GP comes to town. Hello and welcome to Sail GP in Britain's historic ocean city of Plymouth for the third series of season two. I'm your host, Todd Harris. Three races are scheduled for today as some of the world's best yachtsmen take to Plymouth Sound, watched over by the historic seafaring city that has been synonymous with top international sailing events for many years and now welcomes the best inshore sailors in Sail GP. With me are America's Cup yachtsmen, Freddie Carr and Matt Cornwell, and we're looking forward to exciting close quarters racing. Well, Freddie, you've raced in these waters before. What do these numbers tell you? Well, it's a balmy summer's day down here in the southwest. The breeze is on the lighter side, but just enough wind to have five crew on board, I think. The breeze is out of the south. That means it's not going to be flicking around too much, but there are big patches of pressure on the course. It's going to be about linking up the breeze to get your F50 going as fast as possible. Well, there were plenty of crashes the last time Sail GP raced in the UK. High winds took their toll first on the United States team with a spectacular nosedive in the first race. At the final roundy mark of the first race and winds right at the top of the safety limit, the local team Great Britain also crashed. Wing trimmer Chris Draper was injured in the incident as the boat went from nearly 100 kilometers an hour to zero in the blink of an eye. To the scoreboard for the standings after the first two series, and surely it's a scoreboard full of surprises. Spain in their first season at the top, Great Britain in second is no surprise, nor Japan in third. But look down, defending champions Australia in sixth place, the USA is in seventh. Australia stunned with their last place in Toronto, Italy at the last event. But for the USA, it has been bad luck after bad luck throughout this season. At the start of the new season of Sail GP, everyone around the championship sat up and took notice when Jimmy Spithill announced he would be taking over the USA team. Probably the best results in my career to date has been representing the US, so I'm, I'm very, very fortunate and honored, really. One of Sailing's most successful athletes, Spithill has competed at the highest level for over two decades, and expectations for his new look team were high until disaster struck in Bermuda. Certainly didn't envisage starting the first event being taken out by another boat. He's collided with the US crew. This is a big moment on board here that hopefully no one's heard. Bad luck did not stop in Bermuda. Spithill lost valuable points in Toronto after hitting an underwater object. Oh, that looks bad to me. Bam, crash down to the wood. Oh, Jimmy. You can't control everything in a game like this. The fact that we race in the ocean, you, you can't control what's sort of under the water. Without those two incidents, the US team would certainly be challenging for a top spot, but find themselves in seventh, with Spithill eager to make amends. Everyone's reacting in a way that it's been extremely positive. Well, I still believe we can win this season. The fact is that it is a multi-event competition and there's plenty more opportunities on our way. Well, a perfect viewing day here at the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix. Despite COVID restrictions, good crowds have turned out for the second Sail GP visit to British waters, and the inshore racing will give them a great view of the stadium course from the sold-out hoe position and other vantage points around Plymouth Sound. 
On the water, the key to success for the crews is getting their boats quickly flying, sailing fast enough to turn into rocket ships. As each boat and crew weighing over 3,000 kilos flies on a hydrofoil the size of just a small surfboard. In light winds, it's particularly difficult to get up enough speed to get the boat to lift up out of the water. But it's vital. And here's exactly how it all works. We're in a new age of sailing, the foiling generation. It's faster to travel through the air than the water, and that's why it's faster to foil out of the water with reduced drag. The foil produces an upwards force, lift that balances the combined weight of the boat and crew once the boat reaches the takeoff speed. To create the lift needed to take off, the F-50 has to reach around 30 kilometers per hour, 16 knots of boat speed, to take off in a similar way to an aircraft. The flight controller is able to fly the boat by changing the angle of attack of the foil with their controller. The higher you fly, the less foil will be in the water and the less drag you will have. Foil too low and you add significant drag, especially if it results in the boat skimming on the water. However, if you foil too high, air can be sucked down around the foil, which results in a sudden loss of lift and the boat crashing down into the water. It's a fine balancing act. Well, we've seen the scoreboard and it is a bit surprising going into this weekend, but as we look at how the crews line up and what we should expect in Plymouth, it's likely that more surprises are certainly in store. Top of the points table after two series and loving it is Spain. But will surprise season leader Phil Robertson be able to keep it up this week? We have a new leader in Sail GP season two. Nice work, amigos. Yep. They have lost their regular crew to the Olympic Games and hoping to at least partially offset this is racing legend Xavi Fernandez, who switches from coach to wing trimmer. During pre-event training, replacement Lucas Trittle fell badly and can no longer race on board having suffered broken ribs. Great Britain is a point behind, largely thanks to their win in Bermuda with Sir Ben Ainsley at the helm. Go, what a comeback day! Ainsley has stepped off the boat for two events and Olympic gold medalist Paul Goodison takes the control. He delivered an underwhelming sixth in Toronto. What can he do this time around? While his wing trimmer Ian Jensen has shown the way by winning last month's renowned Italian Moth Championships from familiar names including Slingsby, Bruni and, you guessed it, Goodison. Surely one of the favourites following their win in Toronto is Japan. Nathan Adridge and crew will take the win here in Italy. Well done, boy. And the afterguard of Outeridge, Draper and Bruni will be eyeing the top of the leaderboard this week. They'll be hoping for lighter winds in which Nathan Outeridge already stands out from the fleet. But if it blows, they might find themselves struggling as some point to what they say as a comparative lack of power in their grinders. We didn't do good enough. And a mistake like that you can't repeat twice. Swiss foiling expert Arno Sarafagis had a good result in Toronto. New Zealand's first race win in Sail GP. Only narrowly missing out on a place in the final as he substituted for international sailing superstar Pete Burling. Burling has been reported to be pleased with their performance and will return at the next event in Denmark. But in Plymouth, Arno's crew is hit by the Olympics as Andy Maloney and Josh Jr. step off the boat. Surely Plymouth is a big opportunity for France and Billy Besson as they are one of only three crews not weakened by absentees at the Olympics. Their third place in Bermuda showed potential but they were back to seventh in Toronto. Englishman Lee McMillan joined as wing trimmer in season two but it hasn't driven them up the season points table yet and frustration on the boat is high. What are you talking about? I would like to go at this point. And I went and then you said no. What are you talking about? Nothing, nothing, nothing. 
Defending champions Australia had a shocker in Toronto, first with equipment failure and then with poor speed resulting in a humiliating last place. Our worst result ever was a second heading into that and we came away last. Tom Slingsby will be hoping for a windy Plymouth and can never be ignored, but the competition is tough this season. Also under pressure will be new flight controller Ed Powers as he fills in for regular Jason Waterhouse who is Tokyo bound. We have already seen the bad luck that has dogged the USA, who should have won at least in Toronto, and obviously are as fast as anyone in the fleet, and sometimes faster. There's plenty more opportunities on our way, and they'll do whatever it takes to win. Plus, their afterguard of Spithill, Campbell, Janes and Kirby have been making all the right calls. And in Plymouth, they are one of the only crews not affected by the looming Olympics. Sharing the wooden spoon with the Americans, the Danes who don't have the excuse of misfortune to take the spotlight off them. No one has trained harder in the simulator and on the water, but it hasn't been enough and skipper Nikolai Sehested simply must take advantage of having the one of the few intact crews in Plymouth. Let's look at today's race course. As the start gun goes, it's about being as fast as possible, as close to the line as you dare. Over early, and you're gonna get relegated to the back of the fleet. It is a drag race to Mark 1. You have got to send it. At Mark 1, you'll see the highest speeds on the race course. These S50s going three times the speed of the wind. Downwind, the tactical race opens up into gate two. This is a hectic part of the race course. Eight boats trying to fit into a gap only made for four. At the bottom gate, you can choose to go left or right, picking your way upwind to gate three. This is the halfway point in the race. This is where the battles are developing amongst the fleet. The lead boats will be having one-on-one -on -one battles, but just behind them, the dog fight will be absolutely raging as they use the wind shifts and the pressure to get down to the final downwind gate. The final upwind represents the last opportunity to read the wind on the water and try and sail the shortest distance possible to move up through the fleet. You'll be looking for perfect maneuvers, perfect jibes, staying on the foil on this last downwind to try and cash in the points that you've accumulated by sailing your boat beautifully. Last corner into the reach to the finish and the winner will pick up eight points. Well, we are coming up on 90 seconds to go on race number one, day number one here at the beautiful Great Britain Sail Grand Prix on a picture perfect day in Britain's Ocean City, Plymouth. Whether you're on the land or on the sea, it does not get much better than this. As we are now under 90 seconds to go, everyone is entering into the start box. Guys, this is where the strategy begins. Freddie, walk us through what's going to happen here over the course of the next 80 seconds. Well, next 80 seconds, you're looking at the start line here. You're trying to figure out where you're going to position your boat when the gun goes. In the lighter airs, the top of the line has been favoured. It is high risk at the bottom of the line, because if you get overtaken from the boats at the top, then everybody is going to overtake you. The other thing that stands out to hit me here, Matt, is the start box is small, and that's why they're entering this zone so late. It makes it very difficult for them. They have to come in there, you know, with only less than a minute to go, and they're only just entering the box. And you can see the boundaries right there in front of them. So getting your setup right, getting towards the line and getting yourself in a good position is going to be a little bit more difficult for the boats. It's very interesting here that the split, it, fleet, fleet is split in half. Five boats approaching from the bottom of the line. Five boats coming from the top of the line. Looks like the Japanese are a long way back. It looks like they're taking the approach that they're going to try and stay on the foil and keep maximum speed in. We've got USA, New Zealand and GBR lining up for that mid-line launch. The Japanese of still the fastest boat on the race course. Can they thread the needle in behind the Americans? Still looking at the Japanese for great speed here. Nine seconds to go, very close. Here we go, five seconds to go. Race number one at the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix. And the gun goes. The the Danish are just over. They are OCS. It looked like they were going to get a perfect start, but that is not the case. The Danish were over early. They're going to get relegated to the back this of the is, fleet. This is the umpires. OCS Denmark. OCS, OCS Denmark. Denmark. Target New Zealand. Target oh, New Zealand. Race official confirms that the Danish were OCS. Let's jump to the front of the fleet again, and it's Australia that launched off the bottom of the line. A risky place to launch from, but it looks like they've got the boat on the foils. That means double quick into Mark 1. 
Tom Slingsby in Australia, the defending champions in Sail GP out in front. Just off the right-hand side is France, the USA, currently sitting in third. The wind has picked up from what was projected, and so this should be a really good race today here in the first of three. Big moment coming up here, Todd. This is the first jibe of the race, and the boundary's coming up quick, so all of these boats have got to throw a jibe in very, very quickly. You've got to throw a jibe in and keep the boat out of the water. Don't let those holes touch. A lot of shouts oh. in there between the French and the USA. I'm sure there'll be a penalty flag. Back to the Australians. They stayed on the foil. This is an opportunity for the Australians to sail away. And the start is going to be so key in this race. The, the conditions are fairly uh, even. The breeze is coming off the English Penalty France, penalty France, relative penalty USA. France for that um, one. So they must have been clear. to weather. They, they, they keep clear boat in that the situation. Boundary. They didn't keep, keep clear of the New Zealand boat. But yeah, it's a very even breeze coming off the English Channel, and that's why it's key to get a good start. So Australians are in their happy place from where they were in season one. So the Australians have settled down into their onboard patter. The conversation we're hearing now is off the Australian boat. They're talking about standby. This is their second jibe with this downwind. Let's stay on board. Mark Spearman crossing the boat. Listen to the, we're good here, more speed, just a constant performance dialogue as they yep. lead to Mark 1. Two, one. So leg two of seven, it's Australia out in front. The defending champions have the lead. The Americans sit in second after they were infringed upon by the French who have dropped back to third. And look at the boats tacking there already. It shows you how close that boundary is to that, that uh, right-hand mark as they go around. All the boats are coming this way, but they're all going to have to tack immediately because the boundary and the spectator boats are very close to this side. Look, you can see it right there. And here's the first boat to split. We've, so we've got New Zealand and Japan coming around together. Very close. And keep an eye on the Spanish there. The first boat to go to the opposite side of the course. It would be nice if you can get around that left hand mark like the Spanish because you're going to get a nice long, you can carry it down in speed, a nice long port out to that uh, right hand boundary. Australia out in front. They got the proverbial whole shot on race number one of three today here in Britain's Ocean City. Uh, this is the umpire's uh, boundary penalty Japan, boundary penalty oh. Japan. Man, that boundary is really with an unforced air there. That boundary comes up so quick out of that lured gate. It really is a bit of a skewed race course. It's one kilometer from top to bottom, but the way the course is jammed into our racing pitch, it makes the boundary come up so fast. And Japan have had to pay for that. Especially difficult when you've got a boat right next to you too. You're having a look at them. The, the numbers come up on the, on the screen in front of them. They know it tells them how many meters are from the boundary, but very difficult when you're focused on something else. That's interesting. That's the voice of Rome Kirby saying, keep the pressure calls coming here, guys. He's the middle guy of those five. He's the flight controller. And he's controlling the foils that keep these boats up and ripping. And he's relying on wind calls from the other people on the boat to keep him dialed in perfectly. Back on board with Australia, who have the lead. As we've mentioned, they are the defending champions from last year. But it's amazing to think of Australia sitting in sixth place overall, the U.S. in seventh because of bad luck in the first two events in Bermuda and Toronto, Italy, respectively. We saw a touch-and-go tack, as we call it there. They couldn't foil through the tack, so they did a nice job of holding what speed they could through it. They came out on one hull and then just slowly got the boat back out of the water. And up speed tells you that it's sort of sub-18 um, sub uh, kilometers an hour wind speed. Uh, fairly light, but just enough to get back on the foils. We're on board with Phil Robinson here in the Spanish boat, overall leader in season two. Oh, that's an ugly tack. You saw the bows go down and seriously wash off some boat speed here. Doing it the right way, though, is Australia Sail GP Tom Slingsby. Olympic gold medalist. We've talked about the replacements they've had to made because of the upcoming Olympics as several of their sailors have had to step off the boat, but they're making it work here on race number one. They're making it here, work here in race one, and they have had to bounce back from their worst ever result in Sail GP. Last in Toronto in the last event, and here they go. What a way to rewrite your scoreboard by leading this race. And the Americans and French quite close together once again. Remember, it was early on that the French were assessed a penalty as they forced the Americans out on boundaries. So the USA taking full advantage of that, having the right of way as they came into that gate. It's good to see this team doing well too with the frustrations they've had with that bad luck that we showed in the feature in the show. Uh, if they didn't have that bad luck, they could be sitting on top of the leaderboard right now. The two events 
at both times they easily could have got an extra four points, five points, and that would put them on top of the leaderboard. Yeah, close. They're talking about a duck here, Matt, on the Japanese, ducking behind the Spanish. The Spanish got out of phase. They've taken a place here. Oh, wow. Nathan Adridge, wow, oh. just behind the Spanish, and they're going to split gates at close to 50 kilometers an hour, 90 kilometers an hour closing speed. What great driving there. What, what great helming by Nathan Adridge to take the transom of the Spanish. And the another tight crossing. Denmark and New Zealand for sixth and seventh place, respectively. Nathan Adridge, is there anyone you'd rather have thread the needle other than Adridge? Great shot looking down the race course there. We've got the Australians top of pitcher, 53 kilometers an hour leading. The rich are getting richer. They had the best start and they've sailed away. Clean maneuvers. Nick Hutton, local Devon lad, crossing the boat there, right. jumping into his trimming cockpit. He's now in charge of the front sail, the jib. That will add 20% more power as they accelerate into their final lure gate. This is the Australia we're used to seeing, isn't it? Just put a bit more confidence, really tight, good maneuvers. They had a lot of crew changes. Uh, they lost their original flight controller, uh, and then they lost yeah. Kinley Fowler, his replacements. They lost Jason, and then they lost Kinley. A uh, bit of disruption, but this is what we're used to seeing from them. They're this really tight knit unit that sell the boat really, really well. Lots of experience on board on the F-50. Australia speeding away, starting to grow their advantage. The Americans currently sitting in second place with Jimmy Spithill looking to turn their season around. They look good in Bermuda until they had the collision with Japan. They look great in Toronto, Italy until they had the underwater connection. And here they are trying to make amends at the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix in Plymouth. And round in third is the French, Billy Besson. He's my wild card team. I love watching Billy sail. He's such a live wire. A lot of congestion on the left side of that course as France follows the USA. So that's one, two, and three, Australia, America, and France. And then the rest of the field well behind with Japan, Spain, New Zealand, Denmark, and Great Britain. And we saw the cross at the top between the Japanese and the Spanish. The Japanese have leapfrogged the Spanish on this downwind up into fourth. Definitely lighter in general, pressing. There we go, so that's the voice of Tom Slingsby talking about the wind, saying it's lighter in general. And I tell you what, you can tell once long Tom Slingsby's yeah. having a good race through the tone of his voice. Now he calm. is maximum yeah. chill there as he's leading the first race Stand here by. in Plymouth. Stand by, standby, tack, off goes Carl Langford. Sprints to the other side of the boat, and that is a hard thing to do right. on a trampoline at 40 kilometers an hour. They do probably their last tap of their race. We've got one up wind gate, a sprint to the sprint to the last downwind gate, and then into the finish. Another touch and go tap at the top. That does show that it is a little bit lighter over on that top left hand side, probably affected by the wind coming around the headlands on the, uh, the west side of, of Plymouth Sound. Uh, so that does mean yep. there are opportunities out there, nice different uh, right wind gradients across the course, but not that many that uh, it'd make you feel comfortable when you've got a decent lead like the Australian George. team does over this US team right now. Pop, when you hear the boys saying pop on board, that means they're yep, trying to get the boat out of the water. When you get the boat out of the water, you get the boat foiling. When you get the boat foiling, you double your boat speed. So when you hear the word pop, that means use the rake of the dagger board to get the boat out of the water and get that thing ripping. And if you're looking at this image on your screen right now, that is Australia, the defending champions. Picture perfect foiling right there. It's Tom Slingsby and company doing everything right here in the first of three races in Plymouth. And then remember, tomorrow, three more races, and the last race is the final race, which only allows the top three point getters from this event to race. I can't believe we've done two yeah. Winwood Lewids, so effectively two laps, uh, right. and we're under Rocket 10 minutes into the race. This Rocket is where Sail GP is so much fun to watch. It's so good. So that last tack there by the Australians yeah. was a foiling tack, so it does suggest there might be slightly better pressure over on that left-hand side of the there, course. Right? So this is mark number five for those of you keeping track at home. They'll go one more time up, and then it is a short blast to the finish line, and race number one will go the way of the Australians, and look at that advantage. Big dogfight in the mid-fleet pack here. I'm looking at France, I'm looking at Spain, and I'm looking at the Japanese. There's plenty going on in that mid-fleet battle with the Australians and the Americans slightly ahead of them. Remember, it's all about gaining points. You want enough points so on tomorrow when that final race comes around, you're in the top three and you have a chance to win the overall. That's right, Todd. Every point is vital. We usually see the difference between making the final and not making the final down to about two points. 
So this little, for that, yeah, those guys in the back of the pack there, just beating yeah, the boat in front of you, not losing a place, could make all the difference when it comes to making the final in tomorrow's racing. So France sits in third, Spain in fourth, Japan in fifth. We're coming up for another close cross at the top. We've got the Spanish coming in on port, the French coming in on starboard. I think the French will just cross ahead. The next focus point is the Spanish versus the Japanese. It's a role reversal of the last leg. And Phil Robertson takes the transom of the Japanese. This is going to be a simultaneous rounding at the top. Wow, we they get exactly the same time as they go onto the last downwind leg and then into the finish. Well done, all the skippers there, keeping it clean, avoiding any contact. Contact is forbidden by the rules, but it's often hard in these conditions. Boats, you're trying to duck one boat, you've got another boat uh, just close to him too. Meanwhile, back at the top of the course, it is Australia looking very good, still up on the foil, sailing. You see the wind speed, they can double, sometimes triple that, as they will have one more maneuver to make, and then it'll be into the finish. Going max stiff. And max stiff now. And Ed Powie is sitting in the middle of that group, the group of five. He's the flight controller. Yeah. He's making this boat fly beautifully. This is some of the hardest c conditions to fly the boat. He stepped on here in Plymouth, and he's opened his, his account um, with a win and eight points. And look at the speed for Australia. Now they're just showing off. Look at that, pushing nearly 60 yeah. kilometers an hour on a day that they expected extremely light wind. Australia's showing the same form that they had last year. Over triple the wind speed. That is unbelievable. And listen to the hum of the foils. This is full sendy mode from the Australians. Let's listen as they cross the finishing line. Okay, you guys, so stand by. Four down. Race number one in Plymouth goes the way of the Aussies. I tell you what, man, who's pleased about that is local boy Nick Hutton. Local Devon boy Nick Hutton. We've got four Australians on board, and then our wild card Nick Hutton is very much a nation versus nation, but he'll be grinning from ear to ear. This is where he grew up sailing. And the Americans coming in with Jimmy Spithill at the helm. They had a great race. It was just the start. They really didn't give up a lot of distance to the Australians guys throughout that race. They maintained their position, but as fast as Slingsby was going, that is difficult. Slingsby is on point today. You know Spithill will take the points with second, but you know him well, Freddie. He's going to want first in the next race. No doubt. And look at that. The Spanish just creeping ahead, ahead of the Japanese. We knew this, this dogfight in the middle of the pack was hectic. And it looks to me like the French, the Japanese and the Spanish are on a proper sprint into the finish. And it's the French that have popped out in front. So there's third, fourth, fifth and sixth. As we remember back in Toronto, it was one point that separated several boats from getting into the final race and competing for the overall. So these points are valuable. France is on a full on throttle. It's too many decisions. It's too, uh, yeah. That's the voice of Lee McMillan suggesting they need to settle it down. How those guys sell, they actually sell best when they fire it up, in my opinion. France third, Spain the overall leaders in the series this year. They take fourth. And a big surprise for me, guys, Nathan Outeridge finishing in fifth place with Japan. Yeah, they won't be happy with that. They're making a bit of a charge. Very bad first event, obviously, with the collision and everything else that happened. But uh, they, 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 they were by far the top team uh, in Toronto, winning that at a counter, and uh, they'll be disappointed about that. Denmark coming in seventh place, so they will pick up just the two points. And Paul Goodison in Great Britain for a boat that won the event in Bermuda to kick off the season. They are really struggling. Not the result they're looking for, and they've dug themselves an early hole. Yeah, not good for the home team there. They'll be hoping for a really good event. Paul Goodison is keeping the seat warm for Ben Ainsley, but uh, he sees this as a good opportunity to come and sail in this brilliant fleet. Uh, Olympic gold medalist in the laser class, just like um, Tom Slingsby and Ben Ainsley. Uh, he'd really want to prove himself in this fleet race. But it's Australia that takes the win in race number one in Plymouth.
Competition. It's in our nature. It drives technology, performance, progress. Moving faster, pushing harder. Our sport is powered by nature. And we're entering a new race. Welcome to the CLGP Impact League. In the race for a better world, every positive action is a step closer to a cleaner future. Competing to reduce waste, increase efficiency, and shine a light on climate change. Our teams will earn points throughout the season across every aspect of their operations. We're here to make an impact. Race for the future. Back in Plymouth on a beautiful day for the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix. There is a race within the race because at Sail GP, it's all about race for the future, trying to leave a negative carbon imprint. And you look at the Impact League, Freddie, this is all about the boats and the teams leaving the least amount of re results that they were here. Exactly. And the Sail GP is uh, it's a world first in the climate positive sport. We're leading the way in that. And the Impact League, that falls in line with that commitment. And this is Sail GP chucking the challenge to the teams, passing the responsibility of sustainability over to the teams and they are going to be uh, they're going to be evaluated on 10 things across sustainability be it how they travel to the events their diversity and inclusion at the events and obviously the big talking point their use of single-use plastic and how they tidy up after themselves at the event this is absolutely brilliant and there's prize money on it mark prize money on it for their selected charities and the fans doing their part to leave a negative carbon imprint here in this beautiful part of England in Britain's ocean city of Plymouth. All boats must carry the mid-range wing today, standing at 23.7 metres tall with an area of 102 square metres. The foils will be the bigger of the two that the F-50 can use, known as the light air boards, measuring two meters deep and a little more in the horizontal span. The bigger area allows foiling earlier at 27 kilometers an hour, although the downside of increased area and drag reduces the achievable top speed. At the back of the boat, the rudders do more than just steer. To allow the wing to carry more power and help keep the boat level from front to back, each has a horizontal elevator that has to handle forces of a ton and over. Well, under shoreside test earlier this week was the new light air wing being developed for very light wind racing. Still under development, the wing stands at a massive 29 meters tall and is designed for winds from zero to 19 kilometers an hour. Now it will be commissioned later this season, providing a new challenge, particularly for the F-50 wing trimmers who have to handle all that technology. Hi, my name is Chris Draper. I'm the wing trimmer on the Japanese team. Basically, I've got the foot on the throttle effectively. You know, I control the wing and can control the jib, the front sail. And that controls all the power that goes through the boat. Nate's got the steering wheel, which helps affect what angle the boat sails at and how much power there is. 
and then the flight controller has got the flight of the boat and keeps it flying. The other control that I have is the twist of the wing and that changes the flap angle of the wing. If you think of a plane when it's taking off, you know, the plane wing will become more blunt um, when it wants more lift to take off. And we can do that with the angle of the camber and also the twist. So just here, I've got a twist joystick, which is proportional. So if I move it a small amount, it affects the top of the wing just a small amount. And if I put it a big amount, it makes it react very quickly. I have a number of other controls down here, which affect the dagger boards and the jib sheets. And then it can also control the twist of the wing with a foot button down here. We're constantly trying to keep the boat at exactly the right heel angle. And that comes through a combination of the guys trimming the wing, Keko the flight controller flying the boat at just the right height, Nathan and I reacting to the gusts and the changes in the wind speed, and obviously the wind shadows from the other boats around us. So that's pretty much how the wing works. You know, there's lots going on. There's plenty of this, but it's a lot of fun. And you know, I've got the power of the boat in my hand and it's a, an enormous team effort to sail these boats. And there's a huge amount going on with all these buttons around the cockpits that you guys don't see while we're racing around the course, keep the boats flying properly and sailing as fast as possible. This is event number three, Great Britain Sail Grand Prix. First was Bermuda, then it was Italy. Bermuda won by Great Britain, Italy was won by Japan, and here we are to decide who takes home the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix before making our way to Denmark for the next one. Under three minutes to go, just to remind you, Australia won the first race of three today. The Americans finished in second with France in third, and then Japan coming in fourth. So, Freddie and Matt, I turn to you. How do you guys see this playing out with under 240 now to go before the next race? Who are your new favorites for the weekend? Oh, man, I'm struggling with favorites. At every Sail GP event, I struggle for favorites. We've had two events and we've had six different teams on the podium. You know, you can just rip the rule book up. But I do think this could be the moving event. This is where people are going to want to start chucking points on the overall leaderboard. The teams that are under pressure to do that, in my opinion, are USA, France and Denmark, because they are the unchanged teams compared to the rest of the fleet. The other boats that are under a little bit of pressure is New Zealand and Denmark again. They're the only two boats who haven't got on the podium yet. I agree, Fred. It's been very unsettled so far, hasn't it? It doesn't really feel like the season's really got going. Some of the top teams, your favourites like USA and Australia, haven't hit their straps. Uh, I, we just saw them win though, that race, so it's easy to pick on them now. But I think those two teams for me are ones that we'll see try and make a real comeback from those poor two events they've had so far. It is a beautiful day in Plymouth for event number three of Sail GP. This is the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix alongside Freddie Carr, Matt Cornwell. I'm Todd Harris. We are under 90 seconds to go to get the second race of the day of three. And then tomorrow there's three more races. Remember, it was Australia, USA and France, the top three in that first race. So the race is going to go on from 15 minutes from the start gun, but the most important part of the race is going to happen in the next one minute and 10 seconds. We saw the Australians in race one. They got off the line beautifully. They went on and sailed away. So although we're not into the guts of the race now, the decisions that are made in the next 60 seconds are the most important of race two. And it's all about not getting bogged down in the pack. We saw how difficult that was for those sort of four or five teams that finished behind the first two. Very, very difficult. And we've got a similar look to start one. We've got five teams at the bottom repeating that formula. And we've got the same three teams coming in from the top and trying to stay on the foil and trying to do the time run into the line. There's going to be some jiggery pokery here between Great Britain and Australia. Great Britain has got a penalty. They can shake that uh, off. This is the umpires. Uh, that's a penalty GBR, penalty GBR uh, relative to Australia. So they got a penalty well. on Australia. They've got to shake that off before the start. So, uh, the Spanish GBR, are coming from the top here. They look pretty famous, Australia as do the Danes. Second. I'd like to be in the boats doing a time run right now. Nine seconds to go. The Spanish put the bow down. If they get a pop on here and get an acceleration, they will absolutely launch onto the race course. Have they nailed it? As the gun goes, they could be a little deep. Australia in a good spot again. And it's the Australians who get the start again. So Australia gets the jump on race number two with France just off the left-hand side. The Americans look to be a good spot, but they get crowded out. And this is the chaos before the calm, and they hit mark number one. 
got hit repeat, Tom Sling Slingsby. That's exactly how he managed his last minute in the pre-start of race one. He's done it again, and he's sailing away from the fleet. The French are holding onto his coattails as they come into mark one. Again, the pressure will be on the jive after this acceleration moment. Look for the boat speeds to go above 70 kilometers an hour as they rip around mark one. The Australians started there with a very similar setup as they as they did in the first race. They obviously they found a nice little formula and it's working for them. And sailing's all a confidence game, isn't it, Freddie? And uh, you can see that their tails are up, their chests are puffed, and they're enjoying their racing out there in Plymouth Sound. So at mark number one, it's Australia once again out in front. France sits in second. New Zealand up to third with Spain and the USA dropping off to fifth place. And the home team, Great Britain, really struggling here on this second race. And the pressure still looks very even across the race course. And I think just like the last race, that start will have been really key. And I expect to see the Australians extend and defend this lead. They've got probably all the way to the finish. And the pack behind is where all the action is going to be. We're going to go right turn, I think. That's the voice of Tom Slingsby saying we're going to go right turn. So casual, Tom Slingsby and Carl Langford at the back of the boat. Tom, Tom Slingsby, Olympic gold medalist, he's won the America's Cup, he's won the Moth Worlds, one of the best sailors in the world, as they do their final jive into gate two. Local boy Nick Hutton holding on for dear life as he jumps out of the cockpit and look at him race across the boat. Seriously impressive yeah. athletes, these guys. And that relationship, Carl Langford and Tom Slingsby, they've done a lot of sailing together as they go around here, this next mark in the lead. This is almost a carbon copy of what they've done in race number one. This is race two of three on the day. And once again, it's Australia out in front. France having another great run. Remember, they had a good run in race number one until the penalty was assessed that allowed the Americans to move into second. On board with the French, Billy Besson, driving the boat, his red wheel. Getting some advice there from Lee McMillan to fly the boat as the Danish go round in fourth. And the Americans are the first boat to choose the opposite gate as the Danish roll Ooh. into a JK, which is a roundup tack. So they've used their downwind speed to burn a manoeuvre up the race course. And they'll be one of the first boats heading out to the right hand side. But it looked like it got a bit sticky. Guys, let's talk about the start again. You said this is going to be a critical portion. Now watch the boats on the bottom and then the big crowd at the top. Yeah, so I'm looking at the Spanish who are trying to burn some speed, weaving in from the top, but look at the golden kangaroo. With about six seconds to go, they casually slide their bow down. They're talking about boat speed. Boom, the gun goes. And they're the fastest boats in the fleet, closest to the line. It's pretty simple when you see it like that. Yeah, and you see the boats at the bottom, all five of them, six of them piled up down there. And that gave just free reign for the French and the Australians to have such a great start. Slingsby, as we said before, he is absolutely on point today, Freddie. What is the difference from what we saw in practice the last two days to what we're seeing from him today? Yeah. He's got five people on board. The practice has been three-man crews. He's got five people on board. That could be one thing. Hey, man, he's a confident sailor. He must have got some good time runs in before the start. His warm-up must have been good. The energy must be up on the boat. And they sound so calm on board compared to what we saw in Taranto in similar conditions right. when it was fractious. This is super calm from the Australians. But also, as you said, Taranto was a lot of three-man sailing, and we know he wasn't very comfortable with it. And I think it got in his head. And the practice that we saw yesterday when it was three-man, I think that was still there. They don't like the three-man sailing. He's comfortable when he's got his five guys on board. So momentarily, the Australians had one of the holes in the water, and they picked up enough speed to pop both up and now foiling. He's talking about his really right gate favoured. So he's talking about you go not round one mark, but you go through a gate and get to choose which mark you go round. So he's looking upwind and deciding which mark is going to be closest to him and launch him onto the downwind, the middle downwind of the race. We can see some the French there. They're one of the boats, as you said, Freddie, that haven't changed their crew since the start of the season and are therefore under pressure. Uh, looks like the Danes on the other side, just before we saw this shot, were close to them. A little bit about down there. Gate number three, Australia still out in front. France in second, Denmark has moved up to third. The Americans, who finished second in the first race, have now dropped back to sixth. Rolling down. 
This is a big moment for the grinders. Moving the wing sheet, spinning his arms at the front of the boat, moving the white winch for Carl Langford, holding a rope. Carl Langford's the throttle man. He's making sure the wing snaps back on and they can hit the top speeds of 50 kilometers an hour as they go into the downwind. Tight crossing here, Denmark dipping behind France. That's Denmark Sail GP presented by Rockwell, Nikolai Sehested. The helmsman there, and they will be next up to host Sail GP next month. So the French, after that great start, are slowly getting sucked back into this pack. They don't want to do that. So at the halfway point, it is still Australia out in front. Winners of race number one. The Americans making up some ground here. They are now sitting in fifth place with an opportunity to possibly overtake Spain. And they do that now into fourth. On board with the Spanish here, Phil Robertson holding his yellow wheel, driving the rope, the boat. Lovely addition to the Spanish crew in this event, Xavi Fernandez, the wing sheet trimmer, Olympic gold medalist, Olympic silver medalist. He's been around the world more times than I've had hot dinners. What a Spanish sailing legend. The leaderboard on the left side of your screen, it is all Australia as it was in the first race. The Americans losing that position back to Spain. So that's a good battle going on in the middle. But the big surprise, guys, for me, Japan at the bottom of the heat in eighth. They got left behind at the start. They were too far away and they just never got back into the fleet. Standing by for the jive there, repeating the formula they did from race one. They're repeating the formula they did from the first lap. They like going out to this bottom left-hand side of the course. Even though the boundary comes early for them, Matt, they do like this bottom left. And then it looks to me like they like the top right, and it's about linking those two patches together as you sail upwind. That's right. They like to do that long port tap all the way across the course. But they're keeping it very simple, too. They're tending to sail from boundary to boundary to ley line. They're min minimizing their maneuvers, so minimizing their distance around the race course. So every time you maneuver the boat, every time you do attack on the upwind or a jibe on the downwind, the boat slows down. So you're looking in these light airs not to do many of those turns. If you're pulling for Team USA, they're currently sitting in fifth place. Remember, they finished in second place in the first race. But they have opportunities now with just about a lap and a half to go to maybe make a move up as we go back on board with France. I was worried about them at the last top mark when they just seemed to be getting sucked back into that pack, but they've done a nice job uh, of, of, of getting a bit of, uh, a, bit of a stretch on those guys again now uh, with just three legs to go, and that's pretty important, I'd say, for the French team to hang on to the second place. Early tack has been called by Phil Robertson here on the Spanish. They've got great speed, lovely round in there. Expect the board to drop. If they nail attack here, they'll be putting pressure on the French. That's a lovely lured mark rounding. Let's see if they can keep a foiling tack going. Yep. They'll also be very mindful of the Danish who have split the course and are going out the other side. The French, the Danish and the Spanish are locked for second place. Actually, no, Danish out the right. They're looking pretty good at the moment, but good pressure here for us. That's the voice of Tom Slingsby. He's also assessed that the Danish are the first out to the right, and he said good pressure go here for us. That means right good wind. The Americans also going on to that side of the course. As you get a look at the roster for the Australians. Great on board shot there. You can Good see the guys in the front cockpit are consistently spinning their arms. They're consistently trimming the wing with Carl Langford. You might think it's light airs, so it's going to be a little bit easy. But in the lighter airs, it's harder to capture that wing, so you have to be more dynamic with it. Still close in that pack. The French have sort of been dragged back into it again. The Danes went off to that left hand mark and over to the we call it the left hand mark as you look at it as you're coming into it, that right hand side of the course, and they've made a little gain out there, so the French will still be nervous. They don't want to get sucked back into this pack because before you know it, you lose your second place to third, and then you can be fourth and fifth. It's really, really tight in the pack. There's a bit of a pitfall there for those guys. They've got to stay clear of it. And there is the battle between second, third, fourth, and fifth. France in danger of losing out. Nikolai Sehested in Denmark on the charge. Did they choose the right side? Look at the speed difference as Denmark has certainly found the more pressure on that side of the course. But don't forget Spain, the overall leaders in the series right now, still hitting 35. 36 kilometers an hour. Look at that graphic there. You can see Mark 1, first at Mark 1, first now, second at Mark 1, second now. Danes have made a nice little gain. They've taken a couple of boats, but it shows you how key that start was. But as I said, the pack is tight, and that's where the gains can be made. 
I don't think Australia will be caught now. They've shown a clean pair of heels to these guys. Saying that, that's as close as we've seen a boat to them there. But uh, they look like they're, they're selling their own race. They can do what they want. They can dictate it. That's where they're happiest. They like even race courses because their manoeuvres are very good when it's not fluky. And uh, I think we'll see these guys see this one out. But looks like Denmark have taken second place. And here we go. They're crossing the French there. The Danes are in second place. They had to keep clear of the French there, but they were clearly ahead. Looks like they might make this top mark. And uh, that would be really good for this Danish team, which also hasn't changed crew. So also one of those three teams that need to have a good event here. It's an opportunity. It is a very calm boat on board. Australia Sail GP. Defending Sail GP champions from 2020, their skipper, Tom Slingsby, the Olympic gold medalist, having that lead. There you see the advantage, 12 seconds over Denmark, who has moved into second. France dropping back to third, Spain in fourth, the USA in fifth. Days are sailing fast. They had a bit of a turnaround race in the last regatta for me. Race five in Toronto, they had their first top half finish in this season, and they've carried that positive energy here. Second place in race two here in Plymouth. It was a bit of a slow top mark running for the Danish though, wasn't it? So the French have had done a better job, but you can see them already kind of getting down inside them there. Feels to me uh, like the breeze is trending down all over the course from this helicopter yep. shot. It doesn't seem quite as lively as we saw previously. There'll be conversations on board now about potentially changing their manoeuvres as the wind seems to be stepping down to 16, 15 kilometres an hour. That's about seven knots in old money. And everyone other than the Australians right now, guys, have got to be start doing a little math in their head, crack out the abacus, because if you're the Americans and you're sitting in fifth, couple that with a second place, you need to have a huge performance in the third and final race of the day if you want to make the cut for the last race tomorrow. And again, if you can just pick off that one boat in front of you, you can make all the difference. It's great to see Tom Slingsby there. He wasn't looking over his shoulder. That shows you they're really happy with their position. They're not worried about the boat behind him. They've got that nice Angle. lead. Pointed in towards the finish, or the last gate, I should say. Right. And if you're new to Sail GP, all these boats are tuned identical. The only thing you'll see differently is on the wings, each one having their own little sponsor and having an opportunity to race for their causes. Of course, the parlay on board the Aussies, which is the Aussies' way to a greener future and a cleaner home and a ocean for kids and their kids, so a Planet Plastic on board Japan, so a lot of great things being done out there on the water in the race for the future. But this is all about winning for Australia, and they're going to make it two for two here on the first day of racing of two. Remember, tomorrow, Championship Sunday, still to come with three races, two fleet races plus the final race, where only the top three will get in it. But, man, Saturday has belonged to the Aussies. Tom Slingsby and company have done everything right, regaining the form they had back in 2020, and they will take the first two races of the day. A huge win here at the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix. Tom Slingsby and company take a bow. Right. Getting applauded off the fans on Plymouth Great Home. Nice Great job, Ed. That's Ed Powies. He's referring to his flight controller, uh, the guy that I think's got quite a bit of pressure on him. What pressure? Two races, two bullets, two wins. Right, Freddie, he's never done this role before. He sailed F-50s a lot, either used as a trimmer or, or uh, as a wing trimmer or a grinder. So uh, he's doing a cracking job. Uh, two great bullets for him. Great finish for Denmark Sail turning GP, presented by Rockwell. Three, two, one, turning up. And the Danes on, will claim second. Billy Basson three, in France two, coming in one, third, so back to back three. Yeah, so you do the math, one. guys. They're, other than Australia, they're sitting pretty good. Bravo. Bravo, says Billy Besson to his boys. Fist pumps at the front. Nice work, guys, from McMillan. So we've got 11 minutes. And okay. McMillan's already talking them into the third start. I love that. Forget that race. Let's get on to the next one, lads. Spain will crack on and take fourth. Nice. We'll tech over here, guys. Disappointing performance for the Americans after a strong second place finish in race number one. They will come in and claim fifth, so they're going to need a big bounce back, Freddie, I imagine, in race number three if they want to sleep better tonight rather than worry about those points on Sunday. I agree. I agree. In these lighter conditions on such a small race course, if you bang in a t bunch of top half, if you're four and up over the course of the day, you go to bed pretty happy. Fifth, you're pretty happy. 
back three, you're having a head scratch with your coaches. And here's the problem for the rest of the crew, New Zealand, Great Britain, and Japan. Arno Sarafagas coming through in sixth place. He's filling in, of course, for Peter Burling, who's off to Tokyo for the Olympic Games. And then Paul Goodison filling in for Ben Ainsley. Congratulate him and his family for the birth of their son, Fox. They will finish in seventh with Japan. Big surprise there, Nathan Outeridge. Winners in Italy, they finish in eighth in second race of the day. Now we go to Australia, Tom Slingsby. Tom, you make it look easy. You guys have got the yeah, form yeah. that you had last year. What has been the difference here in Plymouth? Uh, yeah, no, we've started well, a long way to go, but no, we're sailing well. We're getting good starts. Uh, we're sailing with confidence. And uh, yeah, we're, we're showing if we get out in front, we're hard to pull back, but we just got to try to stay out there somehow. Tom, with the, capricious, ca the conditions out there being capricious as best, you don't know what to expect. We were expecting light winds today. You seem to get a little bit more help from Mother Nature today. You guys seem to found a, a soft zone or, or a, a comfort spot for yourselves in these conditions. Yeah, look, it's, it's no secret. Light airs are probably our biggest weakness. Uh, for me personally, as a helmsman, it's, it's definitely my weakness. But we've been working on it. It's really been our focus. Uh, our last event in Taranto, uh, yeah, it felt like it was a bit embarrassing to our team. Uh, essentially, I, I felt bad. I felt like I didn't do our team justice. And so we've been working on our light airs. It's a real focus. And I'm glad so far two races in it's working, but we've got a long way to go yet. Tom, thanks for your time. Good luck to you. We'll see you in race three. Take a look at the scoreboard now as Australia makes it simple. Two wins in a row. They pick up another eight points. Denmark with a great finish. Nikolai Seestead finishing in second. And the Danes ahead of France. Billy Basson makes it two threes in a row. Spain and then the USA. So now all attention is being turned to the third and final race of the day. There are the updated standing. Slingsby eight and eight takes him to 16. The Americans currently sitting in third on 11 points. The sport of sailing for me has got way more extreme and it is scary at first. What I've discovered in this sport is you've always got to keep scaring yourself to make sure that you're comfortable feeling uncomfortable. Between events is all about training, trying to keep developing your skill set, keep the brain ticking over and, and, and make sure you come back to the next event a lot better than what you were and that is really, really difficult to do. It's not easy, there is no other boat in the world like the F-50. For me it's about foiling, you've just got to keep foiling, you've got to keep pushing the boundaries of what you know, what you've learnt, you've got to keep learning. I guess what's fantastic about living in Gothenburg at the moment is we've got a great bunch of guys all pushing the moth fleet really hard and we're sailing every day of the week. You need that sort of group of people that are just pushing each other because one person will raise the bar and everyone else has to get there. What you learn from doing something smaller is you're a lot more connected to the foil. For instance, a, a kite foil, you can feel everything through your feet. You jump on an F50, you can't feel anything through your feet. You've got to be sailing smaller things, you've got to be doing a bunch of different sailing as well as on different crafts because you learn so many different things about foiling when you sail a kite board a moth, which all translates into sailing an F50. Day one of the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix from Britain's Ocean City, Plymouth. This will be race number three, the third and final race of the day as the fans have turned out in force. 
as we take a look at the analysis, Matt, of what happened in race number two, and that was exciting, especially if you're a fan of Australia. Well, we talked about the importance of the start. Look at this start analysis, Australia. So it's a very even race course, so it's key to get off the line in a good spot. Distance from the line, 1.67 meters, that is nothing. Speeds, they were faster than any other boat. That meant they were first at Mark 1 and they finished the race first. Very simple, but it's actually a dark heart starting well and they did a fantastic job. An absolutely beautiful day here in Plymouth as we get set for the third and final race of the day before Championship Sunday. Tomorrow will be two more fleet races and then the final race where only the top three point getters will compete. And right now, Australia looks like they have almost punched their ticket in. Australia leads with 16. France sits in second and the USA hanging on to third by one point over Spain and Phil Robertson. All right, let's have a look at race two. We had that classic five three split, five at the top of your picture, three trying to come in from the top. Keep your eye on Australia here. As Matt just said, they were about a meter and a half off the line when the gun went, and the fastest boat, and they launched onto the race course. The Spanish getting it a little bit wrong. I called them as my favorite with 10 seconds to go. They just slowed down too much, and the Australians sailed away. This is the Danish boat going around the first lured mark. I thought they did quite a nice job of splitting the fleet and they were the first boat out to the right. There were fourth round that lured mark, they came back in in second. And what can you say about the golden kangaroo today so far? We've said in commentary, they just sound so calm on board. They're starting brilliantly, their manoeuvres are fantastic. And Tom said himself, he's a confident sailor. He said he hasn't sailed as badly as he did in Toronto and he's bounced back brilliantly in Plymouth. Great job, Ed. Nice, boys. Well, for local boy Nick Hutton, part of the Australian team, sailing back on his home waters is a special feeling, and he's looking forward to racing here in Plymouth with his brand new team. I grew up sailing in Kingswear, which is opposite Dartmouth, which is just literally around the headland a little way there and it's so nice to be back in Devon racing with CLGP and it's a top class racing circuit and we're very happy to have it here in Plymouth. Sailing in Devon is something that a lot of children will do growing up. There's heaps of people on the water and out enjoying what they have on the doorstep which is you know the beautiful coastline of Devon and Plymouth Sound and the Ho here and it's you know it's a great place to hang out. Plymouth as a sailing venue is, is amazing and you can see the wind and the guys that are going to come up here and watch us over the weekend are going to get probably the best view of the year if they come to Plymouth to watch the racing. The city is called the Ocean City so you know they understand about the sea and everyone gets it. And my real hope for CLGP and for Plymouth is that we can get people down here to watch the sailing and, and watch what we do in the water. And this is a probably the best venue to be able to see actually what's happening from above. It's a great opportunity to showcase what CLGP can do and what we can bring to the city of Plymouth. For me, sailing for the Australian team, it is, it is slightly awkward here. There's no getting away from it. But for me personally, I, I'm sailing for an Australian team and I want to win for that Australian team. For me, it'd be great to win the UK event at pretty much home. You live literally on 10 miles around the coast, so it does feel like home. And it's the first time I've actually been able to race in this sort of circuit this close to home, so it's a real treat for me. Nice warm day in Plymouth. Freddie, this is a typical British uh, summer, right? Yeah, it never rains in Britain. <laughs> it's always 28 degrees, you know? This is what we're used to. We just don't tell anyone about it. We don't want it to get too busy here. And look at that. I mean, can you think of a better viewing for this course here in Plymouth up oh, on the Hoe? Not at all. I mean, this is where sailing is now. It's about sailing in natural amphitheaters around the world. And natural amphitheaters where we're sailing the most incredible boats. These F-50s, I can't speak highly enough about what they can do. We're sailing around in 15 knots of breeze here. And the last reach into the finish there, the uh, boats are coming in at 65 kilometers an hour. That is mind blowing to me. And they're doing it one kilometer off the shoreline. Coming up on three and a half minutes to go before we get to the third and final race of the day. It's all about the crew roles and what they do during the hectic race. 
on an F50 in Sao GP, there are five key roles on the boat. You've got the helmsman role, which is what I do on the boat. Really the main thing that the helmsman does on these boats is they make the decisions on where you go on the race course. They communicate to the crew what your plan is. And most of the skippers in the teams, myself included, are heavily involved in the logistics of the event. So moving forward in the boat, the next position is the wing trimmer. And the wing trimmer needs to have a really good understanding of how to generate power and how to distribute the power in the boat. So it's, it's a lot of fun, you know. I've got, I can basically control all of the power in the boat at any one moment. I have to put the wing in the right shape and tell Nathan, communicate to him the best modes for us to sail to get to that goal as quickly as possible. So moving forward, one more position is the flight controller on our boat. He's responsible for keeping the boat in the air. You know, every time the boat touches the water is a time that the flight controller has made a mistake. He needs to keep the boat flat, keep it locked in going fast. He has to have a very good relationship with the helmsman and the wing trimmer to make sure that the boat is locked in and going quick. Okay, so at the front of the boat, we have two grinders positioned. There. One grinder faces forwards, one grinder faces backwards. Both of the grinders at the front are turning the handle for the winch to make sure that we can trim the wing sheet as effectively as possible. Leonard Takahashi is our primary number one grinder. He's facing forwards. Yuki is grinding, he's facing backwards. He's looking at Chris Draper in the eyes. He's making sure he knows what Chris needs in terms of the amount of power. He also has to be very brave because he's going around a race course extremely fast, facing backwards, and so he has to have a lot of trust in the guys behind him. He comes from a rowing background, so he's used to going backwards, but he's going backwards now at 50 knots, so it's a little bit different. Ninety seconds to go until the third and final race here at the Great Britain Sail Grand Prix. Todd Harris, Freddie Carr, Matt Cornwell with you guys. It's all about accumulating the mass amount of points so you can get in that final race, Freddie. And we've got some good stories brewing in the middle of the pack. We've got some good stories brewing everywhere, to be honest. We know that GBR is struggling. We've just heard of our chief umpire. They're currently on three points after two races. They're going to get deducted two points for contact in the previous start. So a really tough day for the Brits as they go down to one point. That's very tough for Paul Goodison. Ben Engsley handed this team over to him in first place. And how's he going to hand it back? He's really under pressure. This is interesting. Everybody's at the bottom of the line now. They've seen what Australia have been doing to launch off the line. And it is an absolute traffic jam down there as every single boat is trying to fight for that one spot that is going to launch them perfectly. This is going to be much harder for Australia to execute. Dane Denmark are rumbling nicely here. They've got the most speed. 28 seconds to go. Japan are the controlling boats. They're holding up the boats inside them. Japan might have just opened the door for the French and the Kiwis to come off the bottom. Spanish still looking at the top. That's where they were in race two. Can they do a better job this time? A good old fashioned SIG alert on the 405 in the USA as we come up on five seconds to go. And here's where it gets chaotic. Who's going to time it right? Oh, man. Oh man, if Phil Robinson gets away with that, it will be something else. Apology for sort of some industrial language there. Wowee, what a run into the top of the line there from Phil Robinson and the Spanish. They got it wrong in the start of race two. They nailed it in the start of race three. That was a proper cheeky uh, maneuver. This is the umpires. This is the umpires. Uh, Spain, uh, you have been black flagged from the race. Oh, black flagged wow. out of the race! Yes, Phil Robinson! Oh, God. So that Phil means Robinson goes from being Houdini to black flagged. Oh man, listen to me. Phil Robinson's not happy. He's been kicked out of this race. Send your boat back to the dock. No one could get to us, Craig. Oh my goodness. He's not happy about that black flag. That means he is disqualified. The umpires thought that was such a bad foul. This, they had the option to This is to the season two the leader. Just being this chucked out the, the race. Leader. Yeah, that is huge for the for the uh, context of 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 sale gp for the season right i need to calm down let's get back on the seven boats that are still racing what are you seeing todd <laughs> i just heard someone say well that was lucky and i wonder if it's coming off the american boat because they're currently sitting third place overall spain was one point behind them so Here's let's the look at this one todd. more time do you agree with the call I don't know, let me watch it, let me watch it. There's lots of shouting. So we're looking at the Danish and the Spanish. Could they have got to him? Oh, and then the Americans 
Oh, I think it's that probably the foul on the Americans is what I'm seeing there. We're on board with the Americans here. Would they have cut him in half if they kept going straight? Yes. Absolutely. In my opinion, they'd have sunk him, Matt. You You're the saw rules Jimmy, expert. You saw Jimmy's wheel there. He had to turn down. Uh, the Spanish with a keep clear boat and Jimmy had to avoid. But look at the Brits here. Mm. Look at the local team, the home favourites. Paul Goodison taking over for Ben Ainsley, who is on baby duty. We congratulate him and his family for the birth of their son, Fox. He'll be back for the Denmark race. And this is the result that Goodison was hoping for when Bainsley, Ben Ainsley stepped off the boat. Yeah, they need to win this race. Let's be honest, let's not push anything else around it. They've had two bad races and deducted two points. They need eight points from this race. We talked about the pressure he's under. He seems to be doing just fine under the pressure. But again, it was all about the start, wasn't it? Really key. They've got a good start. They've learned from the previous two where they'd struggled. And uh, they're in this race. And the Australians, look, going around the mark now, are struggling. So a really, really chaotic start. And it's uh, sort of throwing everything upside down. What a race, race number three, the black flag shown to Spain as the rest of the fleet sails on. The biggest surprise here, guys, the Americans now in front overtaking Great Britain and Australia. Have they backed off? Have they left the foot up the gas pedal just a little bit, do you think? No, I don't think so whatsoever. What we're seeing in race three is a full flip of race two with GBR and USA at the bottom of race two. And here they are leading. This is a really tough spot on the boat. Let's listen to the comms, Paul Goodison. Copy, we're going for one and in right. Pressure looking better than it feels a little right shifted as well here. There you go. So he's talking about the wind. He's talking about what angle the wind is hitting his boat. So Paul, Ian Jensen there saying we are not attack and cross at the moment. That means when they tack onto port, they lose all their rights within the racing rules of sailing. And Jimmy Spithill could cut him in half, just like he could have done to Phil Robertson. So even though the Americans are in second place on our picture, it's they are actually in the controlling position. They have the advantage, no question about the Americans who finished in second place in race number one drop back to fifth place in race two. There we go. So Paul Goodison saying we've got to match. So that means the British boat has got to wait until the Americans tack. So we're going to see a Simo tack. Who can do the best foiling manoeuvre? And in the background, the French are hanging in there. The French might have something to say about this. Can the Brits stay on the foil? Yes, they do. That's a lovely high pressure tack. Right. The French are coming yep. in from right of pitcher. The French are going to have a big say in what happens here. They're both going to have to dip the French, but the Americans are slow. This is going to be a penalty. Oh my goodness, you can't do that, Jimmy Spittle. And they could do the same to the Brits. I don't know. Did the French have to avoid there or not? That's going to be a really close and tight one for the umpires. And that was the question I had, guys. Who had the right of way? Was it the French the whole way? The French had the right of way on both of those boats. The question is, did they have to change course to avoid those two boats the umpires would be taking a close Matt, look at would that. you have protested if you were billy besson oh you always protest even if you think maybe well you, you put it in the hands of the umpires there's no harm in pressing the button it'd be interesting to see what they say they certainly would have pressed their button there wow if i was driving one of these boats i'd be protesting everything i'd be way too trigger happy <laughs> Great job by the US though, if they do get away with this, they, they did a great job earlier on in driving down to stop the British from being able to attack, they knew what they were doing there, they would have been talking about it just as the uh, Brits were talking about it just ahead of them. That seemed like a water case of plain chicken and Jimmy Spithill did not blink. Well, they had to go for it. In that situation, you've got to go, actually, if the duck they would have had to have done, might have meant they wouldn't even laid the mark and it could have been worse than uh, than taking the penalty so they went for it the first three boats jibing just quietly the french are having a very good day they're second overall after two races they're sailing clean bravo you are looking at U.S. Sail GP, where just moments ago, Jimmy Spithill forces the issue, does not blank, does not give way to France. No penalty assessed, so the Americans maintain their lead. Great Britain in second. And we take a look at this start. This is where the black flag came out. The bottom of the screen is Spain. And Freddie, they had looked like they had it on time and distance, perfectly timed. And then all kinds of chaos. So concentrate 
on the stars and stripes of the USA, the blue hole. Ignore the Danish. I don't believe that's where the infringement was. It's on Jimmy Spithill and Phil Robertson here. We saw Phil Robertson get shut out by Nathan Outridge in that same position in Toronto. This time, he doesn't get away with it. Great starts by the Brits and the Americans too. It's all about being fast with about five seconds to go and they did a really good job. And shortly thereafter, the black flag is shown to Spain. They protested verbally. The word comes down, Spain off the course. So what was an eight boat fleet is now seven. The third and final race of the day, everyone racing for valuable points. Remember, three more races tomorrow, but to get into that last race, you have to be in the top three. Paul Goodison needs to convert this position, having had a very poor first two races. Him and the boys really need to convert this one or number two to jump them back into tomorrow's all important Sunday racing. And so does the USA. We know there's a little extra pressure on them because their crew has not changed. They are one of those three teams. So they need to have a good event here. Uh, they had a great first race, a slightly dodgy second one, but they're uh, making amends with this one and looking really strong, which they need to do, as do the French and the Danish also, not changing crews uh, for this, uh, this third event here. Well, Matt, currently, if the USA lead this race and Australia finish in seventh, the Americans would actually be leading overnight. So, yeah. pretty good day, all yeah, in all. really good day. And uh, the bounce back that we expected to see from the bad luck those guys have had. A moment of pause there just moments ago where Jimmy Spinnell asking Rome Kirby what if they hit something. He said, just a little bit of seaweed, no underwater objects, no rocks, nothing. They're good to go. So the Americans maintain that lead 78 meters ahead of Great Britain, who've had struggles in the first two races. And there's France staying consistent, guys. Another third. 400 meters to go until the last one would mark. And the platforms are absolutely locked in. When I'm talking about the platforms, I'm talking about the catamaran holes. They are nose down perfectly by three degrees. That's a fast mode. And they are not wobbling from one side to the other. And that's on the wing trimmer. So the wing trimmer and the pilots on board these two boats are flying them beautifully. It's not all about the driver. It's about everybody on these boats. And this is a big day for the pilots. So the Americans are the first to make that maneuver beautifully. They keep both holes out of the water. This is leg five of seven. So they'll head back down the course and then a short blast to the finish. Oh, bad tack on the British boat behind them. That was a pretty key tack by the American team, actually, because they did have to get get that tack in and cross over the Brits, which didn't happen for the Brits in the last race. Uh, but then we saw the British do a bad tack behind them, which will just help the Americans extend this lead. You can see that gap has just grown a little bit. So coming into this gate number five, Jimmy Spithill, USA, Sail GP, looking to be in control. Rome Kirby calmly communicating with his driver. That's interesting, that noise. Are you all right, Jimmy? That's Rome Kirby, the flight controller, asking Jimmy whether he's happy with where he's put the boat. The British boat coming in for their bear away. This is where the acceleration zone is. You can hear the whistle get more high pitched. That's oh boy. Another tight crossing, France has to give way, and the Kiwis go underneath, forcing France to dip. We'll see what that costs them in time and distance as the Kiwis and Arno Sarafagas moving up to third place, France dropping back to fourth. And the Kiwis probably the most affected by the Tokyo Olympic Games. Yeah, New Zealand losing Pete Burley, Blair Took, Josh Jr., Andy Maloney, all stepping off the boat, but they will be back for Denmark. Is the lead boat, the United States of America. The grinders are low in the cockpit. That's a good indication that they're pretty chilled out. They're grinding on their knees. Why would they be doing that? It's about an aero game now in sailing. It's not about a hydraulic, uh, a hydro game. It's about an aero game. Low windage, much like a cyclist in the Tour de France. Heard that moments ago. Jimmy Spittle not quite sure if they had another lap to go. Kind of like, kind of like Tom Brady, not know if it was fourth down or not. But he turned, yeah, Jimmy, just one more, and then we're in. And when you're that calm, guys, and when you're, things are going that well, it, it's a joy. I think that's a good example of him being in the zone. You know, just sail the boat fast, leave everything else up to the boys in front of you. That's right. It's all about where his focus is. And that's what a good crew does. That, that's, that's the beauty of sending the same guys over and over again, isn't it, Freddie? Is that you get to know what each other's roles on the boat. He knows the other guys are looking at what the course is. He can just worry about where he's putting the boat, keeping the boat ripping fast in these beautiful foiling conditions and uh, on these very, very technical and hard to sell boats, the hardest race boats to sell in the world. But these guys are the best, and it helps when you trust the guys around you. 
So you, maybe an opportunity lost for Great Britain, guys. They had two poor races to start things off. They had the lead, but now they are sitting in second place. But no one can match the speed of Jimmy Spithill and USA Sail GP. They are certainly the class of the fleet in this third and final race. Big surprise for me, Australia, who had been dominating the first two races, two wins in a row, sitting now in seventh. Yeah, as a, as a neutral sitting here as a pundit, this is a great result for the overall series here in Plymouth. This is going to close it right up. Even the British fans can appreciate the Yankees and what they're doing here in Plymouth as the win goes to the USA squad. You got that yellow and black? Yeah, blue, blue, blue. So the Americans with the win in race number three, Great Britain with a great performance on home waters will grab second place in the all-important seven points that go with it. That's a nice bounce back, isn't it? That is a nice bounce back. They needed it. To be honest, if they finished in the bottom half of the fleet in race three, it would have been a long shot to come back and get the podium race. They went from sixth to first in Bermuda. Hey, solid. Lee McMillan. Yeah, really maybe nice the most days. consistent boat is France. Three, three, and three. So three podium finishes. A great job by Billy Bassone and his yep. squad getting it together, being consistent. Here comes New Zealand, and their skipper Arnold Sarafagas just holding off Nathan Outridge, who in the last two days of practice looked almost unbeatable. They'll take fifth. The Danes will finish in sixth with Nikolai Sehested. And something we've seen in Sail GP so far this season, when Nathan Outridge and the Japanese are deep, they've sailed through the fleet up to the front. Today, when they're at the back, they haven't been able to do that. But I think that comes down to the course we've got today. It's a very, very even course if you don't get a good start. Oh, and here are the Australians coming up in last place. They were having such a good day until that point. Uh, just didn't get the start right. They did a slightly different start, which is probably part of it. Uh, they weren't going fast at that sort of four seconds to go before the start and uh, got bogged down in that pack and, and couldn't even pick off one spot. So a tough last race for them. The third and final race of the day goes the way of Jimmy Spithill and USA Sail GP after all their problems hitting an object in Taranto, Italy, colliding with Japan at the first event in Bermuda and Hale. They turn it all around. It seemed like these three races just seemed almost perfect. Now, they weren't spot on in race two, of course, finishing in fifth, but a second in race one and a top finish in race number three is just money as they prep for Sunday in championship with the two races in the fleet. And then hopefully for them, they will be in that final race. As we take a look at the scoreboards, first, the USA now has moved into first place by way of that third race win at one point clear of Australia, who finished in seventh place. They are in second. France, again, consistent. Three, three, and three tied with Australia. And then the big battle will be on between Denmark, Spain, New Zealand, and how about Japan dropping all the way down in eighth place. They got a lot of work to do, but remember, two more races to go to make it good, to possibly make it into that final race. The third and final race belongs to Jimmy Spithill, USA Sail GP. Jimmy, welcome back to the winner's circle. What was the difference between that race and what you've seen the first two races of the day? Well, I think it's just trying to get out clean off the start. It's you know, very, very difficult in this tight track to, you know, get around the other boats if you get caught up in the pack. And that one, we're just able to extend, and the boys did a great job. Take me through that black flag incident with Spain. Uh, you just uh, played a little game of chicken earlier with France, but on that time, uh, Spain just was not giving you anywhere to go. Do you agree with the umpire's ruling? Oh, for sure. I mean, Phil's getting a bit of a reputation for doing that sort of thing, so we weren't surprised at all. Jimmy, as you get ready with your crew for tomorrow uh, and the conditions that may be a little bit lighter, what are you expecting and what do you guys have to do to make sure that you're in that third and final race? Well, yeah, it does depend on the conditions. You know, today we got to sail with five up, which is great. But if we go to three up, then we've got to change roles and adapt to that. We had some big issues with one of our rudders today. So we definitely went 100%. And hopefully we can solve that right now. Jimmy, appreciate your time. Good luck to you guys. Get some rest. We'll see you tomorrow. So Jimmy Spithill and U.S. Sail GP get the win on the third and final race. A good day for them, a second, a fifth, and a first. Freddie Carr, if you're Team USA, you got to feel pretty good about the way the day went. Hey, how was that answer about Phil Robertson? There's a bit of needle building there. Phil Robertson is getting a reputation for that sort of thing. That's really interesting to me. We know Nathan Outridge shut Phil out in Italy. Jimmy nails him there. 
is the cowboy, is the Spanish helmsman, Phil Robinson, getting shut out by the boys who don't like him leading Sail GP Season 2. Yeah, well, fantastic seen. racing for the fans to watch today. And tomorrow there are further three races, the last race being the all-important final contested by the top three boats on points. It all kicks off half an hour later and promises to be an absolute thriller. But Sail GP isn't just about the best sailors in the world. It's also about inspiring the next generation of sailors. And in Plymouth, the competition to even get a place on the foiling dinghies has been fierce. Here we have the Inspire program. It's a world-class racing program to try and identify the next generation of diverse, high-performance sailors. It's a training clinic for they have pro coaches, uh, followed by racing each day on these, these wonderful uh, Inspire wasps. And uh, you can see them here. They're sailing on the Sail GP race course. And this program is to build a more inclusive sport from the ground up. Uh, creating the next generation of climate advocates too because 100% of the people that come through this program are educated about a sustainable future. Now we're looking to put 10,000 participants through this uh, program in the next four seasons. Fantastic conditions out here in Plymouth at Britain's Ocean City. Well, the fans enjoying world-class racing today, and the third race was absolutely amazing. A real shocker at the start, Freddie Carr, as the black flag comes out for the first time this season. I'm going to talk about a black flag. Let's take that out of sailing jargon. That's a red card. You're getting sent off. That's a flagrant foul. It's an ejection in American sports. You're out of there. And what we had today was our season leader for season two, the Spanish getting chucked out of there. Let's roll back to a different start, the start of race one. And we know the, the Australians came and they dominated those first two starts. Matt Cornwall picked it up in his analysis. It is about being as fast as possible when the gun goes. Rolling forwards to start three. Keep an eye on the Spanish. They are ripping. They're thinking we're off the line here. Wait for the line to turn white. And we'll get to mark one. Jimmy Spit, who was like, no, mate, you can't do that. You've barged your way in there. He'd have hit his protest button. Umpire Craig Mitchell, who's with us here in London, is looking at all the computer graphics. We call it the ump app. That means it's not down to his interpretation of the rule. That is fact. In the umpire's booth, that is fact. It's not about what he thinks. Phil Robertson was going to infringe. Then there was a bit of fruity chat between <laughs> Phil Robertson and the umpire. Umpire was right. Phil Robertson, get out of there. And Season the bottom line leader. is, if, if Jimmy Spittle doesn't change his course and he had the right of way, he goes right into the Spanish oh, boat. Oh, man, there's carbon everywhere. And people are having to swim. And the shore crews are having to fix a lot of boats. That's an unhappy shore crew. So the series leaders, Phil Robinson and Spain Sail GP, they are sent off with a black flag, and so they're unable to get any points in that third and final race of the day. The Americans under Jimmy Spithill's watch have the lead, and what an impressive day of racing across the board as the Americans lead it with 19 points going into the second day. Australia sits in second. Now, they had a disappointing third and final race, but they look strong, remember, in those first two races getting wins. Billy Besson in France, they were the most consistent. Three third place finishes. Nikolai Sehested had a nice second, which put them in a good position. But remember, everyone trying to get into the top three positions, and then it will all be over. Championship Sunday looks like this. Race number four, five, and the final, which will have just the top three point getters. So races four and five become critical. Still an opportunity if you can get those points. Remember, eight points for a win. So really, everything to play for, especially if you're at the bottom of the board. But if you're Jimmy Spithill, you want to be consistent. So on behalf of Freddie Carr, Matt Cornwell, and our entire crew, I'm Todd Harris saying so long for now from Britain's Ocean City in Plymouth. We'll see you tomorrow.